Well, hello there, YouTube. It is around 7.15 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on a Thursday, which means we are going to be painting here live until about 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So for those of you that may be new, uh, that are watching this as a pre-recorded video or watching this live at the moment, these streams are scheduled to be every Tuesday and Thursday between 7.15 p.m. Eastern Standard Time to 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So just to keep it simple, around 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So we are going to talk about the power of imagination. And we have spoken about things similar to this in the past. So we have spoken about artistic license, which kind of involves imagination. But today we're definitely going to get into some uh, talk about imagination and painting. First of all, let me say hi to those of you that are currently here watching live. So, hey, Sad Hill, uh, Kathy, Minno, Stephanie, welcome everyone. So, imagination, what does this mean? You know what imagination means in general, but in this painting today, you'll notice that there are, in fact, two photo references there. I usually don't have more than one photo reference, and sometimes I don't even have a photo reference. So, um, the reference for the model, obviously we're going to use here, and I, I plan on working on the hair, maybe a little bit of the face today. We are going to finish this frame uh, at the moment, we're going to cover the background, and then we're going to start to put the flowers that are going to exist in the bottom, uh, on, on the bottom of this uh, composition. So I'm just going to quickly mix up some kind of goldish color for the, uh, the frame. There's just a few little details that's left here, and then the frame is good to go. Speaking of imagination, the frame itself is completely made up. That frame doesn't exist in nature. If you look at the picture frame behind the model there, it's nothing like the picture frame that I'm, I'm painting. I mean, it's similar in the fact that it's a frame, but that's all it has in common. So I'm just mixing up whatever, but the uh, most important colors that I like to use for a goldish um, a goldish hue is lead tin yellow and Indian yellow. And since this is on a different plane, whoops, uh, since this is on a different plane, this has to be a different value than this. So that's why I'm actually mixing up more of a reddish, a darker reddish tone. Hey Ellie, Ellie who? Let me move my iPad a little closer. Okay, so a little bit of medium. And I need to get my T-square. We're going to thin out the paint a little bit. Like I said, this detail stuff can be probably the most boring thing to watch on the internet. So please feel free to ask any questions, art-related questions, that you would like me to talk about. And how about you tell me... When was the last time you painted something in a painting that you had completely made up? So with zero references. And what was it? So we've got two questions kind of going on here. Got to make sure that this is the same size as this. Okay. And of course my hand moves. So this is more just a tedious thing. It's kind of hard to keep the T-square straight. And I'm going to have to wear gloves in just a second. So I clean off the T-square just like a palette knife.
Hey, Menno. Today you bought a tube of Indian yellow because I mentioned it. Oh, awesome. Yeah, Indian yellow is a great color. Uh, it is very transparent. It's very... Um, I don't know how to describe it. It takes a lot of it to change a value, so it's a great tinter. So that's why I like to use it to make things kind of yellowish. It's also a dark yellow, which is rare. Yellows are usually very light. And Indian yellow is a dark yellow. I'm glad you like it. Okay. So let's charge up the brush once again. And just for you, Menno, we're going to use a ton of Indian yellow. A ton of it. A lot. Light tin yellow. Neo McGilp medium. A little bit of Gamsol. Make sure the paint is nice and thin. Okay. A-L-E-H-U, you use it for golden glazing. That's a good one, that's a good one. I should probably take your idea myself. Indian yellow glaze. I don't think I've ever done a glaze of only Indian yellow. Sounds like a great idea. The paint is just not thin enough. A little more general spirits. Oof. That was a close one. That line almost did not work. I'm just kind of using gravity to guide my hand straight down. There we go. Hey David, Indian yellow plus white has a nice mixture. Yes, it is. It's a very bright, bright yellow. It's almost deeper than, or should I say more saturated than cadmium yellow. Alright, so this looks a little curvy, but that is actually because my canvas is loose. So you, you notice how loose the canvas is? Yeah, it wasn't that loose uh, when we started this painting, so I've been neglecting it. I haven't really been um, tightening the canvas. I mentioned some weeks ago that uh, because there's such high temperature fluctuations in the studio, my canvases tend to loosen up sometimes, so it's not a problem. I just have to tighten it. So just in case someone notices that's a wobbly line, it isn't. It's just is a wobbly canvas oh yes with burnt sienna too stephanie the last painting you tried without a reference became a really horrible landscape now you need to paint over it well we have those things happen to us once in a while um i've paint over i'd say in my lifetime i've painted over more paintings than exist uh, than completed paintings of mine that exist. So don't don't feel bad. And a painting from imagination is hard. Uh, I think it's a little bit easier with inorganic things like this picture frame. It's just an architectural thing. It's not as complicated or as intricate as like a landscape. And even Bob Ross, who 
is famed for painting landscapes uh, seemingly from imagination. Did have some uh, motivation from references. And of course a lot of motivation from his uh, native Alaska. Also Gamsol, Neo Megilp. All right, so I'm going to have to put this T-square over top of the line I just painted so this can fit where I want it to fit. So sometimes you're going to have to do that if you're painting something architectural. Uh, it's tough to keep this brush straight. There we go. That's close enough. Like I said, it looks wobbly, but that's my canvas. Actually, this one did get a little wobbly. Oh well. Nothing's perfect. Looks like we got our first robot to get rid of. Let's see. The robot has been blocked. You know what's next. And now robot has been reported. Blocked, banned, and reported. All right, so now I just got to clean up the brush since this isn't a different this is in a different plane these little bars are lighter than these notice that these are darker i was going to make it lighter i mean darker then it ended up being lighter so whatever it's just going to end up being darker this little bar is actually a plane change so let's go with burnt sienna viridian uh, Indian yellow. Hey, David. All right, so because this is a plane change, I have to freehand paint this. K in Maine, also a fan of Indian yellow. Yeah, I don't know what I would do without it. Uh, I paint so much gold in my studio paintings. And kind of a hidden effort that's not so hidden anymore. Uh, that the paintings will sell for more if I paint gold in them. Hey David, you, you painted a person without a reference and you don't know who it is. That autocorrect is pretty funny. <laughs> um, so yeah, painting a person without a reference, that's got to be the hardest thing imaginable. I've done it maybe like twice in my life. I dare not show it. Um, that's hard. I'm, I'm very, very impressed. Oof, a well, little too dark. Okay, now we're going to jump up in value. And I um, I may have mentioned this a couple weeks ago. Maybe it was even last week. 
I don't know, the weeks are all just kind of seem like all jumbled up, but anyway, I switched my lead white from Williamsburg brand to Michael Harding. So, um, not for any particular reason, it's just Williamsburg was all sold out and I needed a big tube of lead white, so I got Michael Harding. And it works pretty great. It dries a little more slowly than Williamsburg, but it has more of a creamy feel. This little piece of it is finally starting to dry. It's been on the palette there for, I don't know, like two days now. And I store my palette in an airtight box. So it's not like I just leave it out in the open. A little bit of medium. Now we're going to add another line. And for this one, I think I'm actually going to use a, a sable brush. So let's charge up this size 4 cat's tongue. When you're painting a thin line like this, this is more of a, almost like a carpentry kind of thing, like a paint, paint handling, a craft, craft personship thing. Um, and you got to use a lot of paint and you've got to thin out the paint that you use. It doesn't quite work if you use a small amount of paint and you don't thin it. And it doesn't work if you use a small amount of paint and you thin it too much. So you've got to get just the right amount to make this line. It almost turns it into kind of like a, I don't know, like a melted butter. Oil paint tends to be like melted butter, but a really, really melted stick of butter. Okay, so... Next, there's going to be some little details. Let me zoom you in for the details. Like I said, a lot of paint. A yellow ochre, barn sienna, viridian, there's almost always something architectural in these uh, paintings of mine with environments. Hey Menno. One thing you struggle with oil painting is you need a lot of patience. Definitely a lot of patience. And don't try to do it all in one day. I mean, notice I, I didn't even like, I, I left like this row uh, done or column or whatever. And that was the last thing I did on Tuesday. And I just let it be. Just continuing it today. Hey, Aisha. Uh, I'm glad that you like the way that I uh, make these videos. Hey, Misty. Okay, so now the little detailed things.
Now that I'm doing detail stuff, a little tip for those of you that may be new to painting or have been painting for a while. Never use your wrist to move your brush. I cannot emphasize this enough. Notice how I'm using my fingers and my wrist. Well, actually, you can't see my wrist. Hold on. Uh, my wrist is straight. There's a photo reference. Let's get that thing out of the way. Uh, there you go. So see how my I'm only using my fingers. And even when I'm my arm is extended like this, when I'm painting like this, I actually minimize movement in my wrist. So I try to work through my arm when I'm painting. And the reason for that is you've got to protect your wrist uh, when you're painting. You you can really I don't want to say you're gonna damage your wrist, but you can make your wrist feel very uncomfortable if you move it a lot when you're painting, especially when you're doing these little fine details like this. Hey Misty, uh, how much are my lessons and how long? Uh, yeah, the online classes are $10 a month. That gets you access to all of the um, uh, pre-recorded videos and the playlists for each project along with uh, access to the weekly virtual classroom which um, the virtual classroom is a pre-recorded video that I uh, upload every Tuesday I'll show you the virtual classroom here uh, the rules for it and those are the rules for the virtual classroom so feel free to take a screenshot of that uh, the virtual classroom rules um, just are, are there so students can know uh, how much information or how many images they can send me uh, each week uh, for a video, a virtual classroom video. And I always give students up to three pointers of advice. Sometimes I don't even have three pointers, um, but up to three pointers of advice. And um, again, that starts at the $10 a month. Um, and then moving up from there, you have the live stream uh, tier which means you can watch the lessons live uh, each lesson is one hour long I do two lessons a week along with uh, a group zoom tier which is another uh, level from there and then I have one-on-one -on -one zooms I currently have one slot left for one-on-one -on -one zooms for Friday afternoons of course, Eastern Time, Eastern Standard Time. Hey, David. Same for car painting, airbrush, no wrist. Oh, well, there you go. Um, yeah, so the same, the same kind of idea is in multiple disciplines. There we go. Yeah, definitely have to keep your wrist straight. All right, I'm going to move the camera. Uh, just a little disclaimer, every time I move the camera, I run the risk of the screen uh, going dark. If for some reason I move the camera and you see the screen go dark, don't panic. That's just my cable on uh, disconnecting. Also, the online classes I teach uh, in a classical method. So I don't just go and start with color right away. I work through an underpainting method and build up color. Uh, let me show you an example. So the um, online classes consist of projects uh, that you can work on your own pace. And we're working on this Vermeer master study at the moment. Uh, it's the current project that we're doing. And the painting was developed is being developed through a very loose underpainting. 
So, see, I didn't even put some of the still life. There's still life here that's not there. And there's some still life over here that's not quite there yet. Uh, but I'm building it up with color. And uh, this is the first project where students actually move faster into color. So, for the majority of the online projects, you do work with a more simplified, uh, careful method than what you're seeing me do here. Yep, the wrist is definitely sensitive. Hey, Misty. Uh, okay, so to get into the lessons, all you have to do is just go to um, my uh, link, the, the patreon.com slash artist. It's pinned as the top comment here uh, in the comment section. It's also in the description box of the video. It'll take you straight to my uh, Patreon site. Once you um, select a membership, uh, I will send you the uh, necessary class descriptions and playlists. I'm also, um, I'm on the computer all the time responding to messages from students from Tuesday to Saturday. I'm usually away on uh, Sundays and Mondays. So if anyone ever sends me or joins on a Sunday or a Monday, and I don't send you the links right away, don't panic. Uh, you will get the links on the following Tuesday. So I've, I've definitely had some questions about that before. Alright, so now we're going to put the final line here for this frame. Thin out the paint a little bit more. So you have to charge up the brush a little more. So a little sloppy on the edges, but oh well. Oh, thanks, Misty. And for that one, I don't think it was cobalt blue. Um, it's ultramarine blue. But it does kind of have a true blue, cobalt blue kind of feel to it. All right, so let's see here now. I have to connect this little bar here. I totally missed. Yeah. Just when you think you're done with the picture frame, there's an edge to it. All right, close enough. All right, so now we get to move on to the hair. And the other day, someone was asking about glazing. When do I use it? What's my favorite um, method of glazing? Actually, I think I asked that, but um, so 
we are going to glaze a little bit for the hair in order to add more texture or not just texture uh, let's just say contrast you'll see what I mean when we get to it first I need to clean off the section of my palette where I put the medium so what I do is just with the lead white there goes the camera excuse me so just like with the lead white I actually take the old lead white put it in a separate pile either to the left or to the right um, so last time I think it was like yesterday when I was painting I took the lead white the old lead white and put it to the left and then the new lead white went to the right so I do the same thing with my medium too so it doesn't matter where but I guess I'll put the old medium over here and the new medium will go right there and that's just the way that I keep the palette organized uh, trust me I'm very disorganized in like a lot of things in life except when it comes to painting uh, my studio I clean as much as I can I keep the palette as organized as I can the brushes I um, don't clean every day not even every week but I keep them in plastic bags to preserve them when I'm not painting with them so there's a little more medium remember that is Neo McGill medium of course my camera is trying to fall again try to keep it straight hey sad hill Let's see. Outside. Mm, let me see what you mean. Not sure what you mean. Can you clarify what you're saying? If you're saying that the painting is a man, you might be insulting the model, which would get you kicked out. So, um, clarify what you mean. And if you mean that you're insulting the model, you will be banned from the stream. But I doubt that that's your intention. Alright, so I've got another brush here that I took out of a bag. And I was using it just, I think, two days ago. So I don't always clean them from one day to the next. So what I do is I put them in a plastic bag and then put that in the freezer. So this still has kind of some fresh paint on it from the other day. So I'm going to have to mix up a glazing color. So I'm going to go with a purple with cobalt blue kind of a grayed out purple I'm going for a grayed out purple. Let's see. So I'm going to let you keep saying what you're trying to say, Sad Hill. Uh, any moderators that are here, don't worry, I'll take care of this person, if I have to. Let's see. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry, Sad Hill. But your comments don't work with this stream. I'm sure you're a great person, but I have had to block you. 
from here. You have been hidden by me. I think you might still be able to watch the videos. So you're not blocked from my YouTube videos, but that kind of commentary is not suitable for live streaming. I, I as an artist, am demonstrating for viewers. I'm not here for opinions from other viewers. So I'm sure you're a great person and all, but I don't think that that kind of commentary is going to add anything to everyone's experience watching this video. So you have been uh, hidden from my YouTube channel. But no hard feelings. I'm sure if I met you in person, we'd probably hang out and talk about cars or something. Under different circumstances. So I'm adding a dark glaze to the model's hair. And I'm going to add light into the glaze. So this is how you glaze. You just add medium and paint. Depending on how much medium you add, you will change the thinness of it. And the paint has sunken in a lot, especially on this eye. It's actually not, it wasn't painted as um, opaque, or not opaque, um, chalky as it looks. But sometimes when it sinks in, it can look chalky. Hey, Mariah. Oh, I'm glad to have you back. Thank you. I'm glad you like the velvety glaze. Well, I'm going to paint into it so it's not going to look like that uh, once I'm done with it. Or I guess it could. I don't know. But I like to put in a dark glaze and then add light to it. So I'm going to change brushes now to the brush that I was using for the frame. Hey, Misty. Oh, I know I did block him. <laughs> uh, I'm not that nice. I mean, I try to be nice. Um, like I said, uh, human communication is a very complicated thing. In the internet world, things can get lost in translation, so to speak, very, very easily. So in order to keep the dialogue as useful and beneficial for everyone, I have to be very selective with who I allow to uh, contribute to the conversations here. In the past, I ran into trouble because I didn't, um, you know, control the chat as much. But it, it saddens me to have to, you know, kick people out. I don't ever want to be that kind of person, but that's uh, just part of running a YouTube channel, unfortunately. Hey, Canvas Dancer, uh, what causes the paint to sink in? Good question. Uh, so the the surface, uh, the can the surface that you're painting on, the support, when the painting layer, when the layer of paint dries. In fact, this is all sunken in. Uh, when this dries, the layer can absorb the oil 
into the canvas, which is normal, or whichever surface you're working on. So it's just oil absorption. So when the oil is absorbed in there, then it looks kind of chalky, which is not a bad thing. It's just a natural occurrence. And when you oil it out or you glaze it, it brings back the luminosity because it brings back the shine. So these are more orangey, uh, dull orangey, that is, uh, highlights in the hair. Hey, Angela. Oh, good. I'm glad you uh, like how the painting is turning out already. So I'm mixing a kind of brownish red using alizarin permanent, orange molybdate. Hey Canvas Dancer, no, no need to apologize. Keep, uh, if you have questions again about the materials or anything art related, please feel free to ask. No, no need to apologize. Is it only certain areas or colors that sink in, or does it all sink in? It all sinks in. It's not just one area. Now, uh, there are ways to make it sink in less. So if you thin out your paint less, uh, so if you use less mineral spirits, suppose I had used no mineral spirits when I added this in, it would have sunken in less than it has. Um, so. The more you thin out your paint with odorless mineral spirits or any solvent, the more it'll sink in. So it, it just sinks in everywhere. But there are some instances like when there's more solvent used uh, where it will sink in more. But it doesn't matter where on the canvas. Uh, it The canvas should be, uh, the surface of the canvas should be evenly distributed in terms of how it is primed. So every area has the potential to sink in uh, equally if painted in the same fashion. Yeah, don't feel, uh, don't be afraid to ask questions everyone. I, I do have to control uh, the chat. So for example, uh, if two participants are like fighting with each other which i'm sure won't happen uh, i have to block them both uh, if if a participant is openly criticizing the painting or the model they will be blocked like what happened today uh, but you have to try to um, you have, if, if you slip up once you will get bland, uh, banned from here but as long as the conversation is art related, you'll be perfectly fine. Don't let me intimidate you. <laughs> Trust me, you'll be fine. Okay, main sink in means bond in the layer underneath. Uh, so sinking in means, uh, let me show you on the webcam. So uh, on the webcam, Look at the glare side. Uh, now here, you see how this eye, this looks dark relative to everything else. This is what it looks like when it sinks in. And if I move out of the glare side, so if I move you over here, 
you see this is almost a gray. So that's what sinking in means when the darks just appear to sink or get chalky. That, that's what sinking in means and that, that's the most obvious place where it has sunken in. And in order to correct that, uh, what I will have to do later is glaze into it just like I'm doing with the hair. And the hair had areas that was um, sunken in as well. Some things like um, this drapery, this didn't sink in quite as bad because I didn't use any gamsol. So this, if you look at it from this side, it doesn't look as gray as this. So this was done with mainly uh, Neo Megilp. This probably had more mineral spirits because I wasn't adding medium yet there. That's what sinking in means, and that, that's what it looks like. So now I just have to adjust my camera. So let's hold on a second. I need to call in tech support to adjust my camera for me. I can't just answer. Oh, I'm glad that, that that helps. Hey, D. Russell. Uh, yep. This is uh, this is all oil paint. Yep, K and main exactly. That's another way to think about it. The uh, the darks slash the shadows, darks and the shadows um, would seem set back a little bit. Yep, that's one way to think about it. Ad Russell, um, yep, it is uh, oil paint. Um, do I prefer oil paint to acrylic? If so, why? Very good question, and I don't want to step on anyone's toes. Um, people that are you know, fans of acrylic painting, um, you know, you can use whichever medium you like. Um, I prefer oil paint over acrylic paint. The number one reason is the uh, archivalness or ar archivability, is that the word? Uh, oil paint is more archival, in my uh, opinion. You need some scientific testing to back that claim up. So for me, it's pure conjecture. Uh, so don't take it as fact, it's just conjecture. I suppose that oil paintings may last longer than acrylic paintings if kept in the same conditions uh, as acrylic paintings. However, I don't know. Acrylic paint is so new, it was only invented in the past hundred years, I think, uh, and oil paint has been since like, I don't know, the 16th or 15th century. Um, so that's one of the reasons. Another one is tradition. I really love the tradition of oil painting. It goes all the way back to uh, da, da Vinci. It goes back to Sargent. Does it go back to Da Vinci? I'm thinking of Van Eyck. I'm thinking of Van Eyck. Uh, it, it goes all the way back to um, Caravaggio, uh, Velasquez, Artemisia Janileski, just the history behind it. Um, and I just, when I was a child, I, I was drawn to oil paintings and museums. So that just drew me to it. Another reason, um, Russell, is I have used acrylics in the past. I know how to use them. Um, the problem I have with them is that they dry in like five minutes and it, it's very hard for me to uh, achieve a nice soft and controlled edge with acrylic paint and I think it's just because I don't have the experience enough necessary experience with acrylics and also another thing is you don't have lead white with acrylics I don't think um, you know, the color range is not as vast I don't think uh, with acrylic so it's all conjecture oh yeah all the way back to Titian too Hey, Yug, welcome. Hey, Menno, uh, you enjoy the mesmerizing, profound uh, color of oil paint. 
I agree. Oil paints are definitely... They have a nice sheen to them. And, and you can see through the layers with oil paint. I mean, if you were here in this room with me, uh, you'd be able to see the layer that I glazed over top of underneath of this. And underneath of that, you can see the canvas, the tone of the canvas. So it's it's very nice, you know, it's, it's, there's transparencies in it. It doesn't just cover it and uh, cover all the previous things that we did. But no, uh, no hatred towards acrylics. I have students that um, only use acrylics and they're doing just fine, so. Don't think that I'm saying one is better than the other. It's all relative. And with less pressure, I'm getting a darker mid-tone. That's one of the things I really enjoy about this method. Uh, you see this? When I press harder, it makes a brighter highlight. You see this? When I apply less pressure, it's not as bright of a highlight. Oh, David, acrylic paints were invented in the 1950s. Yeah, so definitely in the past, like, within the past hundred years. Very young for a medium. Hey, you, your name is actually not Hugh. Oh, whoops. You should join me. Um, since, you're, since you're on the Patreon... Uh, if, since you're on the uh, online class, the first Thursday of every month, around 12 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time, I do a live chat using Zoom. So if you can put it in your calendar, if you'll be free on a on the first Thursday of uh, April, we can hang out on Zoom. So then I can really learn how to say your name properly. <laughs> Uh, oh yeah, I don't doubt there's definitely many beautiful colors made with acrylics too. Hey Carol, I'm glad you appreciate my YouTube channel. So could I talk a little more about composition? Uh, and you're, in you're interested in the topic of composition. Well, certainly. Um, so there's many ways to think about composition uh, in, a, in a painting. The first is... Think about composition as the way that you guide the viewer's eye across the painting. So you can control what the viewer will see first in a composition if you plan it out that way. So for example, I am controlling the fact that the viewer's eye will go right here. Um, the first time they see this painting, their eye is not going to go over there. Your eye is not going to go over there. So just in this little square that you're looking at here, your eye probably went here, and then your eye probably went here. And then your eye went all around, and then you're like, oh, okay, there's a hand, and there's hair there and stuff too. You ever notice that there's some pictures or some paintings that you look at, You've probably seen them many years ago, and all of a sudden you see something different, something new that you haven't seen before. Does that ever happen to you? I'm sure it does. And that is just because we can control the way that the viewer's eye travels. So for this to be the main focal point, it's very simple. The darkest dark is next to the lightest light. This draws the viewer's eye here immediately. So that's something compositionally that you can do with values. The next is going to be the placement of lights and darks. So this is one big light surrounded by one big dark. And this one big dark is surrounded by a whole bunch of other shapes that can guide you towards the eye. Another thing, another way to look at it is this angle this angle, this 
line, even this branch here, and this hill up here will guide you towards the model's face. Did I plan that out? Not really. It just happened. So uh, had I planned that out, then maybe it would have been uh, more obvious, but that's another way that you can use composition to draw the eye here. But I don't want to get it too complicated with it because it definitely can go further than this. But that's a brief little conversation about composition. Hopefully that, that helps you out. And I'll talk more about it in the future, certainly. Especially when we enter into uh, new paintings as well. Uh, different ones, that is. Okay, so uh, I missed another comment here. Uh, let's see. I'm trying to look for questions here. So Russell, you're talking about wanting to go back to oil paint. You're currently using acrylic to uh, see the difference. Well, it's good to explore, good to explore. Okay, that's a good one. Um, Painting in acrylics is a great way for you to learn because it's harder to use than oil paints. It, it's harder in some aspects, but it can be easier in others. And the you can actually underpaint the same day. Uh, but I will agree with you. I think, for in my opinion, acrylics are just much harder to use. So we've got a robot here I'm just getting rid of. All right, so let's get back to the hair. So I'm controlling where the highlights are going to go. So Kathy asks if you can glaze with acrylics. Um, I'm sure you can. Uh, they do have mediums for acrylics. Uh, I just don't know which one would be the best. But I feel like that would be much more risky if you started introducing mediums to acrylic paints because acrylic paint is already so new. It's such a new material and now we're adding new materials to a new material. So uh, I, I feel like that might be a little risky, but it, it would be a nice experiment. So you can, but the paint has to be very watery. Paint on, then rub off. That's uh, too complicated for me. Now I'm putting in a plain there's a different plane change here so this is one group of hair and it ends here and then there's another group of hair Okay, so now we're going to move further down with the hair. Uh, 
And once we're done with this, we're going to have to mix up a color for the background and then we're going to start to block in the flowers. We won't finish the flowers today though. We're just going to start them, just kind of hint at them. And this method that you see me you've seen me do here, I can do multiple times. And this will just grow and grow and grow and grow in the depth of field. So this will all get darkened out next time. And then same exact process, just keep pulling more and more light. And there's going to be more layers for the hair. It's a really wonderful effect that I like to use. I make sure these edges don't look super sharp. I don't want them to look very predictable either. I may have to pull some of the hairs into the landscape. Hey, Canvas Dan. So yeah, there's slow dryers for acrylics. I've heard the same thing before. But yeah, I, I think I'm, I'm definitely biased towards oil paint. Hopefully that makes sense. There was a strand or I guess um, the top of her hair is actually shorter than the back side of her hair. So this is a longer strand. There's some curls here too. Oh yeah, totally agree, uh, Kathy. Lead white, yeah. Lead white definitely is, there's nothing like it. And that's the thing, there's no lead white in acrylics, not that I know of. I only use lead white, unless I'm doing a demonstration of black and white painting. Because I do figure painting black and white uh, for my online students. So each Wednesday there's a new uh, figure painting demonstration and there's sketches that I do with black and white and I'll use titanium for that. By titanium I mean flake white replacement. Hey Kane man. Oh good. I'm Glad you like the hair. I, I love painting hair. I used to neglect hair so much in the past. Like when I started doing these YouTube videos back in like 2017 or whenever it was, I would rush to try to get the face, like make the face look half decent, and I would just throw some stuff down for the hair and just let it be. Um, these days I really take my time with the hair. Well, I take my time with everything, as you can tell. Um, very much like a turtle.
Hey, you, you haven't been able to notice the difference between lead white and titanium white. The difference is most notable when you're doing portraiture. Uh, if you're doing like a, a still life, you might still notice it, but it wouldn't be as noticeable. And lead white uh, has this property of which you can use more of it without raising the value too much which allows you to have a thicker consistency of paint. Think of like a Rembrandt or a, um, basically any, any Baroque painting, any 17th century painting, are definitely heavier paints. So for the background, I'm going to mix up a, maybe a bluish purpley gray. This part is going to be very procedural, um, or should I say, uh, I don't know, um, more like house painting, I guess. Just mixing up a color that I want. If this were a pre-recorded video, I would probably just fast forward through this. My lead white actually started to dry here. I'm going to have to add a little bit of solvent to this. So this will sink in because I'm adding some solvent to it. I'm just trying to loosen up the paint that's still wet in there. The Russell pace of a turtle is your goal. Well, that's great. Um, I'd, I'd say the more experience I get with painting, the more I realize it's not so much the consistency of finished paintings that I produce. It's it's just the basic rule of it's not the quantity, it's the quality. And there's nothing more wonderful than having a painting that you're actually proud of to look at. And I just can't do that if I'm working on like a you know like one painting a week or something like that. I mean I can but that's purely for different purposes, I should say. I am going to have to add a shadow on the wall from that picture frame to make it look more 3D. So let's see what I can do. I'm going to mix up. So I'm actually digging into my old piles of paint. So when oil paints dry like this or like any of these little piles, they kind of form a hard layer on the outside. But you can actually dig into it with your brush and access clean paint. That's what I did with my lead white. You notice I just took it off with a palette knife and there was some clean or uh, usable lead white inside. Why am I using this brush for the background? Because I don't feel like cleaning another one. Yes, I have a bigger brush I can use for the wall. Yes, it would save some time if I went and got that bigger brush. Yes, it's probably the best thing to do. But I don't feel like cleaning another brush. And this is a Princeton Catalyst Polytip Bristle. This is one of my favorite brushes to use. 
it can take a beating pretty well, so um, I can scrub in backgrounds with this brush without the without damaging the brush like I would with a uh, just a regular old bristle. Hey, D. Russell. Oh, you're talking to Kay. You need to buy new supplies. Stick with the Zorn palette if you are, you know, if you're just getting into oil paintings and you're interested in portraiture. Stick with the Zorn palette. Get yourself titanium white if you prefer to start with titanium white. Um, yellow ochre, cadmium red, ivory black, and you're good to go. You can paint some skin tones with that. Hey Sarah. Well, thank you for your comment. Hey Mino. Yeah, there's a lot of fun when you make the right uh, make the right decisions in your paintings. And it's a good idea to balance long term and short term. For example, I'm going to show you what I did for figure painting black and white. Um, what's figure painting black and white? Uh, I, once again, I teach figure painting in uh, front of the online classes through short painting exercises. So a painting done in one hour uh, just for pure demonstrational purposes. And I censor it because obviously figure painting involves painting nude models i use um for references i use pretty much all the figure paintings on google arts and culture and i censor it so in theory i shouldn't get in trouble for this but this was a demonstration from uh wednesday on foreshortening legs are foreshortened this forearm is foreshortened this uh, arm is foreshortened this is foreshortened even the torso is foreshortened on this model so this one was a lesson on uh, foreshortening that i did on on wednesday and it's a good idea to have a balance between little sketches like this um, short-term sketches especially if you can do figure uh, sketches and uh, it's tremendous fun to be able to balance between um, short term and long term this is an example of another one that was like a couple weeks ago where it's uh, not as foreshortened uh, but you can see the geometrical aspects to it and then this one was focused on anatomy a little bit more than the other one the other one was more about perspective but it's it's great fun to be able to balance um, you know long-term versus short-term painting Hey Diane, the paint you are using looks blue on your palette, but purple on the canvas wall. I don't know how you can tell which color you have. Um, so to me, it's more a matter of feel when I mix with these colors, when I add these colors. Um, so you're correct, it's not going to look the same here. This is wood, and this is not wood, so it's going to look different each time. Uh, but I I love using wooden palettes because of the tradition behind it. You know, wooden palettes are what the old masters used back in the day. So I love upholding that tradition of using wooden palettes. But you're correct. If you use a palette that's more of a gray, a gray colored palette, like what I used to use for those demonstrations uh, in the past, then they will look more like the colors that you were uh, working with but it's all just uh, m memory i guess muscle memory you can think of it like that i'm just used to the way this palette looks oh yeah that's another <laughs> that's right the camera does mess with the colors as well these are two different cameras this is a webcam that you're looking at for this palette the reason I'm using a webcam for the palette as opposed to another dedicated camera 
is because if I use another dedicated camera, a high quality dedicated camera for the palette, it's too much for my account, my computer to handle. So that's just more of a practical concern. Now there's a shadow that's going to be casted somewhere on this wall and I'm going to choose to put it right here. So I'm going to put the shadow here which will move her forward relative to the picture. If I put her shadow here, she's going to be right next to the frame. So this is a lesson on imagination. And this is not really a lesson, that's a misnomer because this is just a painting demonstration, not a lesson, but in any case you can think of it as a little mini lesson. Um, I put the shadow lower. I'm going to move her further away from the wall. So now I can choose how far I want her to be from the wall. So I'm going to put her shadow right over there. Yeah, cameras are weird. And I have to imagine the shape of her head uh, elongated or stretched along the horizontal axis because the light is coming basically at a what like a ten o'clock or eleven o'clock angle. Hey Canvas Dancer, uh, you love the comments about uh, long-term and short-term projects. Kind of like breathing in and breathing out. Oh, that's a good way to think about it too. That is an excellent way to think about it. This is one of the most fun parts in a complicated painting like this. When you start to cover the rest of the canvas and it all just starts to starts to come together. All right, so since we're getting into more and more just kind of procedural things in this painting. Uh, I'm going to ask a question for everyone to communicate about. And um, this is tough because I usually kind of think about these on think of these on the spot. So um, let me see here. Oh, this is a simple one. What is the longest period of time you've ever spent on one single painting? What is the longest period of time you've ever spent on one single painting? And I think for me, my answer would be about four months. There was one time I spent like almost, I guess, no, three months on one painting. And guess what? I ended up painting over it. <laughs> so it uh, doesn't mean that it's going to be my best painting if I spend more time on it. Hey Sabrina, for the shadow, what color am I using? That's a good question. I have to change the light sensitivity so you can see it a little better. All right, so it's a little brighter now. I'm using a mixture between the purple blue end of the color spectrum and the, let's say the red orangey end of the color spectrum. Uh, to be specific, I'm probably using ultramarine blue, burnt sienna, white, dioxazine purple, um, 
Maybe a lizard in crimson. Yes, I just used it. Um, so, and cobalt blue. I don't really think about which colors I'm using, actually, as I create these mixtures. It's more or less of an intuitive thing. And that, you can achieve this method of mixing color without having to think about it through um, color study, which is another subject that I uh, teach in my online classes. That's right, the quote, a painting is never completed, only abandoned. That's, that's uh, some truth right there. Kathy is speaking the truth. My palette is actually in my way. I have to like reach underneath of the palette. My hand is actually right here. <laughs> getting a little a little strange and I'm scrubbing the paint in here as much as I can because I'm resisting the uh, the urge to put in mineral spirits because if I thin out the paint it'll cover it really easily but I'm trying to not use as much mineral spirits to avoid the sinking in to minimize it should I say Hey, Samina. Oh, thank you. I'm glad you like the color. Oh, Menno, you have paintings you never finish, so 12 years. There we go. That's another way to think about it. In that case, I have paintings that are 13, 13 years old. Except they're varnished, so never mind. <laughs> Once a painting is varnished, it's pretty much finished. You could remove the varnish if you want, but... That's kind of risky, so I wouldn't suggest it. Look at that. Now we're covering all the way up to the edges. I've gone through many different uh, color palette setups and many different palettes too. Just physical palettes in my lifetime. This is the first and probably the longest time I've ever had one color palette set up. And I think this is the first time I've ever had a consistent one. Um, and uh, this is a color palette setup that I intend to have pretty much for the rest of my life. Um, and this is motivated from Nelson Shanks. Uh, if you haven't heard of Nelson Shanks, definitely look him up. Nelson Shanks is my superhero. I always call him uh, my superhero. Uh, I met him in like 2009, not 2009, what am I talking about? I think 2011. When I was studying at Studio in Kaminati in Philadelphia, and um, this color palette or this idea of having this many colors on the palette was taught to him through an impressionist uh, impressionist teacher named Henry Henchy, and Henry Henchy was a student of another famous uh, impressionist, Charles Hawthorne, who was also a student. Of another famous impressionist, William Merritt Chase, uh, and so I think that's as far as I can remember or think about. Um, but there's a very rich history to having an extended palette like this. And yes, there's going to be flowers over here. So I'm going to paint into this shadow, and I'm painting the shadow there uh, thoroughly 
with the intent of painting into it because I don't know exactly where the flowers are going to end. So just another practicality thing. Again, I'm stopping myself from reaching for the uh, gamsol. It's it's uh, tempting, but I must resist. All right, so that is too brown. Some more ultramarine blue. You said you wanted to see all of this, uh, th this whole process, so. And doing my best to show you every brush stroke for this one and it's going to be a lot of fun once i photograph this painting once it's completed is I'll, I'll be able to say every single brush stroke is on youtube i don't know how many different videos uh, i've uploaded for this painting we're just now starting to Get to the point where we cover the whole canvas. So if you're worried about the uh, longevity of your brushes, you may not want to scrub your brushes like this. However, this brush can really take a beating. This is the Princeton Catalyst Polytip Bristle. You cannot imagine how many people I'm, I cannot imagine how many people I must have annoyed. Uh, there was one time I made a YouTube video uh, and I was toning a canvas, I think with this same brush, like back in 2018 or something. Uh, definitely pre-pandemic and God so many people are like why don't you just get a bigger brush and I think in that video I said I just didn't feel like it I don't feel like going and cleaning another brush so I'm just gonna use this brush to, to tone and to cover it's the same thing with that YouTube video on acrylic paints that I made um, I don't know how many years ago I had never seen paint tubes with a little spike on the cap and uh, everyone's like you can open the paint tube with the spike on the cap don't you know how to check the spike on the cap you would think after like 15 or so people telling me there's a spike on the cap that I wouldn't would, would know that by now but somebody's probably going to go and comment maybe today maybe tomorrow but somebody's going to go and comment, you know there's a spike on the cap there. So again, if, if I'm annoying you with this small brush, I apologize. But it is what it is. Okay, so we got some comments here from Russell. Is it that four months painting every day? You've spent a month on a painting, but not every day. Um, I'd say just how long you've been working. If you've been working on the painting once every two weeks, then I would say that that counts still uh, as an ongoing painting. So uh, I worked on that painting for four months, not every week. I would work on it maybe twice one week, uh, not at all another week. Um, some weeks I would work on it maybe like three times. 
So the consistency depends on you. Gotta put those lost and found edges. The hair, that would never be sharp. Omeno, uh, oh, you're talking to Kay and Main. David Bonnet, when you paint over another, how do you prepare the old painting? If so, well, first what I do is I make sure that the painting sits for a long time. As long as the layer of paint is thoroughly dry, you can basically paint right over top of it. But what I do is I paint over it with black and white oil paint and just let it dry. I think this painting probably had one one or two paintings underneath of it. So I just paint over it with black and white paint first and then let that dry for another couple weeks. Every once in a while, every once every couple months, I'll go and start painting over a bunch of old paintings. For example, uh, let me see if I can show you one. Uh, a small one. This is a small canvas. I I don't think I used black and white. I used whatever was on my palette that day. But this is a canvas that I can paint on whenever I want. But this has a painting underneath of it. You can kind of still see a face under there. So this has a painting underneath of it. If you're familiar with my Instagram, you might actually have seen the picture of that painting. So that's how I um, prepare my uh, canvases that I paint over top of. So Menno, Mark Chagall, haven't heard that name. Had his own special color palette. So you, it won't get dry. Uh, in four months, it should be. And with lead white, I mean it dries. With uh, Williamsburg, it would dry overnight for me. With Michael Harding, it dries in about two days, sometimes actually overnight. Alright, so I've got like seven minutes. Uh, I really need to get these uh, flowers sketched in here. So they're going to be roughly sketched and next time we're going to start to add more definition to those brushes. So I'm going to zoom you out. Actually I'm going to just step you back. You can see my little iPad there. The iPad of communication. All right, so now to sketch in the flowers. So flowers have the same, almost the same kind of delicacy uh, as a human face. So in order to paint the flowers, or paint flowers in general, in such a way that they are convincing, you have to apply the same amount of uh, let's just say the same amount of control that you would with a portrait. So if you remember how I started the portrait, it was a very loose sketch uh, that I that I did with a few basic shapes and then I went right into color. And that's what we're going to do here. So the first thing is going to be the um, placement. So I'm thinking I want it to be at an angle this way, 
Because I want there to be a kind of a fluidity going this way to go with the gesture that the model has here. Some of the flowers are going to be in shadow. Some of the flowers are going to be in light. Oh, thanks, King and Main. Question from Stephanie. Do you ever remove the finished canvas paintings from the frame and store them? Yeah, I do. I, I remove some paintings from their stretchers so that I can reuse those stretchers. That is definitely something that I do. So these flowers are on some metal buckets. So I am not painting those metal buckets in there. Instead, it's just going to be a big bunch of flowers. So, starting from over here, carrying through. This is where imagination comes into play. I have to stand really far back and look at this. Okay, so I'm going to have the edge of the flowers cut off just here. And I'm going to let this one go off the, um, well, past the stretchers. So next, I'm going to go in with some of the greenish, dark greenish colors. So I'm going to go for shadows now. And I'm going to thin out the paint because I don't care if it sinks in. Because I'm going to paint over this opaque anyway. All right, so now the painting is really going to change. The darks for the flowers. It's going to look like an educated mess at first. Just like the portrait was an educated mess and I have to make sure that I don't distract too much from the model's figure but of course it will distract a little bit And this is what makes composition so hard. You, you do have to be open-minded. You do have to take risks. If you don't take risks, you're going to end up painting the same painting over and over again. Okay, so there's the dark. Now I'm going to start off with the light flowers. And they're just going to be abstract shapes. So I have to squint at what I'm looking at. Squint to simplify. Blur your eyes to see color. In this case, um, this is a photo reference from Unsplash, so I am not going to trust the light or the color at all. Hardly, uh, hardly at all. I'm going to have to make up the, uh, the colors. The grouping is going to be very intricate. So this is one grouping of one, two, three, four, five, six. This is going to be one grouping of, say, three. And now we're going to put a grouping of, I don't know, whatever comes to mind. It will be a grouping of five. And notice these are in shadow. I'm letting it mix with the color that I already put in there. Let's let this be a grouping of two.
A grouping of, I don't know, whatever comes to mind. Making sure that they're not equidistant. These are in danger of being equidistant. So are these, so something's going to change here. This has to go further to the left. Hey, job, good job, thank you. And a grouping of one, a uh, grouping of one probably isn't a group, so grouping of two up here. And there has to be a sway going this way for this composition to work. There has to be a movement. You just got to feel the composition out. You absolutely can't think this one through too much. It has to be a matter of feel. Thanks, D. D. Russell. All right, so the next color of flowers is going to be the orangey one. So it's just going to be a blob of orange, and I'll paint specifics into this later. I may even just move the flowers around later. But what's most important is the shapes. Remember this whenever you have to paint flowers in a composition in the future. Don't start with the individual little spirals or details of the flowers. Start with what you would in a portrait. Basic light and dark shapes. The green is the dark. The light of the flowers is going to be the light. And in the light of the flowers, I'm going to put more dark. Uh, the dark shapes for the flowers. So the flowers will have form uh, on their own. So just like the grouping, I had to think about the grouping there. I'm going to have to think about the grouping here. Making sure that these shapes are not equidistant. Hey, John. It feels to see you walk out of a room, you get coffee, come back. Uh, looking great. Oh, thank you. Thank you for your comment. Thanks, Stephanie. And let's put an orangey flower right on the edge. I like to do this with compositions. Uh, I like to put something just right on the edge. I actually put a Tasmanian devil on the edge of one of my um, one of my other more complicated paintings. So something like that is just a lot of fun. It's a little um, little corner piece there. Uh, even numbers. I don't like even numbers. One, two, three, four. Luckily, this is not uh, the distance between these two is not the same as the distance between these two. So, um, let's put a fifth one here. Now we have five of them. And like I said, I'm not copying the, the reference for the flowers I'm just the flowers or for the picture of the flowers there were some orange flowers so I'm painting orange flowers there's some white flowers I'm painting the white flowers and there's going to be some purple ones there's some bright purple ones some dark purple ones some red Oh, no problem, John. So I'm letting this mix in with that dark shadow that we painted. And you can even show 
we can show some light. So let's suppose this little flower petal here is sticking in out in the light a tad bit. Maybe there's one over here. Going with that sway, this composition. It has to sway, go go up this way. Create a movement. Hey Javi Jav, why don't I like even numbers? Uh, I've got nothing against even numbers, it's just that com in compositions, even numbers tend to not yield um, the same effects. And I think it has something to do with old master paintings. Um, for example, like groupings in old master paintings are almost always odd numbers. That's just how I was taught. Uh, so, you know, that's just part of my education. But also, another reason I don't think I like even numbers as much is that even numbers to me are almost like symmetrical. So, um, I don't want there, want to, too much symmetry to be in my compositions. And then you may wonder why don't I want symmetry in my compositions. And that's just because, uh, symmetry just tends to be a little bit less, um, aesthetically appealing in a composition, but you can work symmetry into a composition and um, push it in an asymmetrical uh, way. Uh, for example, I have one big painting where in the middle there's a wall. Uh, there's a wall here and then there is a patio on the other side. So it's symmetrical, but it follows the flow of um, the composition. Kind of hard to explain without the painting itself, but um, you will see that painting of it. Oh, you have seen it actually. Um, but you'll see it, that painting I'm talking about in the future. Basically, long story short, odd numbers just uh, historically are not used in groupings in classical paintings. Oh, I'm glad you like the concept, Javi Jav. So, Kathy, it's the same in interior design. You always arrange items in odd numbers. See, there we go. I had no clue. I don't have a background in that, so I'm not sure. Hey, John. Oh, I'm glad that uh, you're noticing the muscle on the, the hand that helps with the ball. The hand. Okay, so I think I've blocked in the flowers. Uh, obviously, there's more flowers that need to be blocked in here but this is a good suggestion of the flowers so i'm going to stand you a little further back because this is where you can actually see what the painting truly looks like what it's starting to look like we didn't cover all of the canvas yet but we're getting there remember as i move the camera back i run the risk of disconnecting my cables so there you go, now you can see most of it. Now I'm going to move the canvas so you see it with less distortion. Okay, so that's the point that we're at today. This is my palette that's in the way. Okay, so lots of stuff done today. Uh, very exciting to see the painting start to develop. Uh, like I said before, I'm trying to get this sway, this kind of movement up her arm. It's kind of rhythm, rhythm. You see this rhythm going through the hand and out here. There's a rhythm once again going this way. So that's um, the rhythm that I'm trying to impose on this composition. Um, and it's just a matter of feel. It's not like I planned that when I started this painting. It's just something that's an evolving thing. So at this point, I'm going to ask everyone if there are any last minute questions. So Kay in Maine, this one is 36, uh, uh, no, it's not 36. I think it's 24 by 36 inches. Let me double check that. Yeah, 24. 36 
Got 24 by 36 inches. Oh, thank you, Samina. I think I missed a comment from John. Did you make your paint palette? I make mine all the time. I took a copy of my teacher and got an old one from Italy. Looks similar. Uh, has a weight, so it bounces on one hand if needed. So, John, no, I didn't make my own palette. Um, however, this palette was a hand... It, it is a handmade palette made by um, uh, a palette maker named um, Larry Wiseman. Has been making palettes for like 40 years so uh, he he finished it with like 10 coats of polyurethane so it's a it's a really nice seal it's the perfect size for me too it's uh, i hold the palette for the most part but um, sometimes i'll put it on the table i'm glad you're able to make your own palette john i've always wanted to but i'm just I'm too clumsy when it comes to like using saws and things with sharp edges, so I'm not really the best to make my own palette. Now, thank you for watching, Carol. I'm glad you find the information or the content very informative. Now, thank you, Cedric. Yep, Kathy, I, I think I got to John's question. Now, thanks for pointing that out. Oh, thanks, Leonie. John, rhythm equals composition. You started with old master drawings. Excellent. Canvas dancer, thank you. Thanks, Angela. Thanks, Menno. Oh, thank you for watching, Stephanie. All right, thank you so much, Kay, John, and Barbara. Oh, welcome, Barbara. Glad to see you here. Yeah, John, it is it is a good palette. I, I love this thing. It's 12 by 16 inches, so it fits perfectly. It looks like a bigger palette than it is, but it's 12 by 16. It fits perfectly in my uh, 12 by 16 Stay Wet palette box. Yep, Kathy, I'll see you in the morning. Bright and early, 9 o'clock a.m. on Zoom. Okay, so it looks like we don't have any questions. Any any more questions. So, once again, if you enjoy what you've seen here and you enjoy the content on my YouTube channel and you want to take your online art education with me further, please consider checking out my online classes. Remember, they start out at just $10 a month. The link is in the description box of this video as well as the uh, comment that I have pinned uh, as the top comment on this um, on this video. Uh, thanks again, David, John, and Javi Jav. And thanks for everyone uh, that watched this live. I apologize for some folks that I may have had to have, uh, you know, had some discipline with earlier, but it's 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 all in in the stream i mean uh much love to everyone i try to be as nice as i can to everyone so hope everyone is doing all right thank you so much i wish you all the very best in all of your artwork and i will see you on the next one <laughs>